Hello everybody, my name is Colin Howells. Welcome to this uh, latest edition of Colin's Corner, where today I'll be uploading the fifth of my series of studies in the book of Revelation, this time in chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, the letter to the church of Pergamon. And before switching to the PowerPoint and going through the study uh, together, can I urge you to uh, click uh, on the uh, thumbs up sign at the bottom and also on the subscription and that way I can keep you up to date uh, with what's going on as we go through this interesting book together. But without any more ado, I'll uh, change uh, to the PowerPoint and we'll start our study together. Today, as was the case in biblical days, the names of cities are often symbolical or take on a symbolical meaning, either based on the meaning of the word itself or on something to do with its history. Way back in the early part of the Old Testament, we discover Nimrod, who was the founder of the city of Nineveh, that was associated with the worship of Ishtar. And Babylon, which means the gate of God, was, as we know, associated with the Tower of Babel, the most feared enemy of God's people. Jerusalem, literally the city of peace, became known as the city of David because he made it his capital and part of it became recognized as being Mount Zion. Today, in China, Beijing has part of it called the Forbidden City because that was linked to emperor worship and mere mortals were forbidden to approach. You go to uh, Europe and we uh, visit Paris, which is known as the City of Lights. In the USA, Chicago is called the Windy City, Las Vegas, Sin City. And the reason I call, mention all these different things is because uh, the letter to the church in Pergamon was addressed to a city which was called Satan's City or the place where Satan lived. Throughout the book of Revelation, Satan is depicted as a defeated foe. In a final act of desperation, he wages war on God's people, and he empowers the beast to persecute believers, using the power of the state and of the sword to force them into submission. On other occasions, he adopts different tactics, a more subtle approach. As the father of lies, he, instead of persecuting, seeks to entice and seduce. So not only do we find him waging war on the saints, we also read of the prostitute who seeks to beguile the peoples of the earth. The church in Smyrna, faced intense persecution from a God-hating empire. The same was true in Pergamon, but here there was an added dimension because it also faced an enemy from within, a seductress who is named Jezebel, seeking to entice God's people to commit spiritual adultery. As we continue these studies of Jesus' encouragements and exhortations to these churches, we come to the third of the messages. We remember that all seven were addressed to a wider audience, which began way back in chapter 1, when John saw the resurrected Christ walking among seven golden lampstands. He is the prophet, the priest, and the king. Using symbolic language drawn from the Old Testament, 
John describes the story behind history. That is, Christ's certain victory over Satan and his henchmen. He's no longer the bruised reed, but the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the one who was dead, but who is alive forevermore. He is the Almighty. He's the great High Priest, who not only purchased a people for himself with his own blood, but he makes us into a kingdom of priests. And he speaks about the course of this evil age, where successive tribulations intensify like birth pains as the church history approaches its end. All of this period between his first coming and his second coming are called the last days. And throughout this book, the book of Revelation, John describes how God is working his purposes out, bringing everything into line with his God-ordained uh, plan. This means that Satan can only do what he is allowed to do. It is God who is on the throne. He is working his purposes out, undoing the curse of sin and death until one day he will make all things new. But before we get involved in this particular letter, let's first of all remember him walking among the lampstands. That's not only symbolic of his presence within each of these churches, but also symbolic of the Holy Spirit's blessing. These churches were intended to be a light in the world, a light given to them by the Holy Spirit. As I've already pointed out in previous studies in Revelation, the number seven symbolizes completeness or perfection. And as I suggested last time, together with many other commentators, I believe that through these letters, Jesus is addressing the entire church throughout the course of New Testament history. The historic background to each of these churches is something which is being repeated. Oh yes, it may have been completely different in those days to the times that we're going through today. But essentially, the problems that they faced then are the same problems and challenges that we face today. And in telling those churches to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, he is speaking to us today because he knows exactly what we are facing. When he spoke to the church at Ephesus, he saw, or we saw, how the Lord commended its members for faithfully persevering in sound doctrine, for driving out the false apostles. They hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that we'll come back to today. It was a group that sought to um, bring compromise between Christianity and paganism, and they're singled out for rebuke, as I've said in this study today. But Ephesus, we are told, had lost its first love. And as we saw when we looked at that particular letter, it wasn't a loss of their love for the Lord because they were devoted to him. They were willing to suffer and even die for him. No, it's more probably a, a case of love, losing their love one for the other because they were so intent of chasing out false doctrine. They began to look at each other with suspicion, listening to every single word that was spoken, wondering whether what something behind what was being said was symptomatic of false doctrine. They'd become suspicious of each other's motives and were being hypercritical. And the Lord tells them that unless they repented and return to doing the first things, caring for one another, looking after one another, then he would remove their lampstands from its place. Then we looked at Smyrna. The circumstances facing that church were similar to that which we'll be looking at today. 
the church at Pergamon. It claimed to be the first city of Asia, dominating or dominated by a semicircle of magnificent buildings nicknamed the Crown. Their sizable yet apparently secularized Jewish population had enjoyed privileges enabling them to uh, trade in the marketplace. But the Christians of Smyrna, because they were refusing to submit to the authorities, because they were refusing to admit that Caesar was Lord, they were excluded from these trade guilds. They were reduced to poverty, as well as being slandered by the Jewish population. Many of them had been put in prison. Many more would die at the hands of the Roman beast. But Jesus told them not to be afraid, because their suffering would only last for a relatively brief period of time. Even if they suffered to the point of death, those who were victorious wouldn't be hurt at all by the second death, but would receive a victor's crown. And in the well-known passage of Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, John saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus, because of the word of God. They hadn't worshipped the beast and its image. They hadn't received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they came to life, to life again and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So that reveals that even when it looks as if Satan has triumphed over the saints, he is actually being defeated. As Kim uh, Riddlebarger points out, Satan loses the most ground when his wrath against God and his people is the greatest. So as we travel north from Smyrna, the road follows the coastline for some 40 miles before turning inland in a northeasterly direction up the valley of the Caicos River to Pergamon, standing about 10 miles from the Aegean Sea. In the message to the angel of the church in Pergamon, we read this. Christ commends the church for its faithfulness to his name, even following the martyrdom of Antipas, but he does rebuke it for allowing false teachers to encourage compromise with the prevailing culture. Before going further, we need to fill in some background detail in order to understand some of the things that are mentioned in this letter. Pergamum was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, even if Ephesus was a larger city. As the capital, it was also the seat of the Roman proconsul, and Pliny called it by far the most distinguished city in Asia. It owed its existence to an enormous acropolis that rose some 900 feet above sea level. And its name in Greek, Pergamon, Pergamon means citadel. It was covered by imposing public buildings, an enormous theatre that had been excavated out of the hillside. There was a famous library there, second only to that of Alexandria in Egypt. This library had more than 200,000 volumes in it, and it is said that the word parchment comes from this particular place because it is there in that library that this writing material was invented. There were huge temples on the summit, the oldest being dedicated to Athene, the goddess of Pergamon. At the foot of the Acropolis, uh, Apocalypse, <laughs> sorry, Acropolis, was a medical centre dedicated to Asclepius, the god of healing, whose sign can still be seen today outside chemist shop and everything medical where we see the serpent on a stick. Yes, that comes not from the Old Testament, but from Asclepius, the god of healing which was be to be found in Pergamon. 
and right on the top of this Acropolis, dominating everything, was the Temple of the Emperor Trajan, the official centre in Asia for the imperial cult. So perhaps more than any of the other six cities, the inhabitants of Pergamum were devoted to the worship of Caesar. Remains of several of these temples can be seen today in a museum which can be found in Berlin. And in that pagan city, there was a small church, probably a house church, taking into consideration the number of temples that there were there. And that church lived in the shadow of these shrines, both literally and figuratively. For here was a city that proclaimed the emperor to be divine, Zeus to be a saviour, Asclepius the healer. And yet that church was a lampstand, a light shining in the darkness, a testimony to the Lord God and to Jesus Christ, the Saviour. Ancient writings from that area indicate that the Christians called Christiani were mocked and labelled as infidels to the empire. They were subject to expulsion, imprisonment and even death. The Jews in Pergamum called them the Nazarenes, a seditious sect who were shunned because they refused to participate in the heathen pagan festivals or honour the Greek and Roman deities in the marketplace. So it was their refusal to recognise Caesar as Lord which prompted the Romans to have them arrested. As was the case in Smyrna, the Jews were only too happy to help the Romans identify them to the point that the Christians in Pergamon were faced with the full wrath of the beast. As we read in Revelation 13 verse 7, he was given the power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Having said that, Satan's victory over God's saints was a hollow one. We read, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Now this is clearly figurative language. Not even the most ardent defender of literalism in prophetic writing would argue that a literal sword comes out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus, as stated in chapter 1 verse 16. But if you go on to the internet, you will find that there are pictures of a literal sword coming out of his mouth. But I don't believe that to be a right reference. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that God's word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And the sword is in fact something which dominates this book of Revelation. It is symbolic of Jesus coming to his church as the king in order to build up his people to bring judgment. The sword was a symbol of the proconsul's authority. The Roman governor was given the power of the sword, in other words, the power to execute on uh, the emperor's behalf, execute all those who refused to acknowledge the divinity of Caesar. This double-edged sword that we've all probably seen in films like Ben-Hur, the Roman Gladius, a short double-edged sword from which we get the term gladiator, was that double-edged sword which comes from the, uh, the proconsul. But we've seen that Pergamon was the seat of power. The proconsul had the power to condemn people to death. No doubt he thought that he had power of life and death over those Christians. But in actual fact, it is the Lord who wields the true power. He is the one who has even greater authority. Jesus opens the eyes of people so that they can see the invisible power behind the throne. 
Yes, on earth it may be that Rome had the power of the gladius, but in the invisible world it was Jesus who had the ultimate power. This double-edged sword is the symbol of his judicial power, the power to judge all things according to the truth of God's work. He reminds his church that he is just. It is he who wields the true sword. The message is clear. All those who persecute God's people will in turn be judged by the one who holds the real power. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. But there is also a warning aimed at those who seek to seduce God's people through false doctrine because they too will face the wrath of God, the sword of judgment. The Lord tells these people, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. What does Satan having his throne mean? That expression has given rise to lots of speculation. Some believe it to refer to the altar uh, at the top of that Acropolis for the sacrifices to Zeus. Others believe it to refer to uh, representing Trajan's temple or the centre dedicated to Asclepius, the god of healing, or perhaps even a combination of all three, plus all the other idolatrous uh, practices and places. Whatever the answer, the message is clear. In this city dominated by paganism and emperor worship, Jesus knows who his children are and he knows where they live. He wanted them to continue to shine in the midst of darkness. It would have been easy for them to become discouraged, surrounded by so many manifestations of paganism and idolatry. But the Lord commends them for their faithfulness. You remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, the city where Satan lives. So here was a church that was faced with the same pressure to acknowledge Caesar as Lord as those Christians in Smyrna. And they'd resisted that pressure. Antipas had remained faithful even unto death. Satan had tried to intimidate these disciples, to sap their determination to remain loyal by means of a head-on attack. They'd steadfastly resisted. And nevertheless, all was not well. Satan is always plotting new strategies. He has many tricks up his sleeve. This church hadn't succumbed to frontal assault, so he tried another ploy, that of compromise. Slowly but surely, they were being seduced by false teachers, people who were in their congregation, leading them away from Christ by deceptive means. Or they weren't seeking to force these believers to deny Christ. At the point of a sword, instead they were enticing them by more subtle means. How? Once again the answer is to be found in the Old Testament, where we find something similar to what Jesus is describing here. He says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Likewise, you have also those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. These doctrinal errors were so serious that Jesus threatened to come and fight against the guilty with the sword of his mouth. We'll find that in verse 16. Yes, there were some who were remaining faithful, but at the same time, they were tolerating others, a group that taught that in order to survive, you had to accept compromises with the world. 
and this probably meant becoming a member of the local trade guilds, even if that meant eating food that had first been offered to idols. Perhaps they were saying, hadn't Paul, the Apostle Paul, taught that idols aren't real? They don't really represent anything, and so it's okay for you to eat meat which has been sacrificed to these people. But Jesus takes them to task. He identifies two types of false teaching, that of Balaam and that of the Nicolaitans. We came across the latter, as I've already said, in the church at Ephesus, but they'd been excluded. Perhaps they travelled north to Pergamum. Balaam, first of all, we find details of his teaching in Numbers chapters 22 to 25. Having spent many years in the desert, the Israelites had crossed Moab and were camped opposite Jericho. And Balak, Balak, the king of Moab, sought help from Midian, and together they sent emissaries to the Euphrates to hire Balaam, a sorcerer. Balak offered to pay him well if he cursed Israel. But we read in the Old Testament there in Numbers how the Lord intervened to transform what should have been a curse into a blessing. And so Balak was very angry with Balaam. But Balak still wanted to be paid, even though he hadn't blessed or hadn't cursed Israel, but blessed them instead. And so he proposed sending Midianite and Moabite women into the camp to seduce the Israelite men. We find that in chapter 31, verses 15 and 16. And having indulged in sexual immorality with these women, these Israelite men were invited to offer sacrifices to the Moabite gods. And thus, what Balak hadn't managed to achieve by threats and curses, he accomplished by enticing these Israelites into compromise. The Lord had brought them out of slavery in Egypt, revealed himself to them in Sinai, concluded a covenant with them, and despite numerous rebellions, he brought them to the very edge of the promised land. And there they were, in Moabite territory, on the opposite side of the Jordan, with the promised land in front of them but they couldn't keep their distance from the Moabite women. They'd forgotten their identity as the people of God set apart from him. And instead of fixing their eyes on the promised land in front of them, they started to look round and fell into the trap of immorality and idolatry. The chapters of Numbers reveal that they never formally denied the Lord, but they started worshipping Baal alongside him. It was still a denial of Yahweh, their God. He alone is the true God. He will not share his glory with another. Not only did God's judgment fall on the Israelite man, who brought a Midianite woman into his tent while the others were gathered before the tabernacle. But 24,000 people died of the plague on that day. The whole episode is summed up in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, where we read, They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice, were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor so that a plague struck the Lord's people. These were the two sins, which were the main temptations of Christians in the first century, immorality and idolatry, the two things which characterised the Roman Empire, except among the Jews. The Romans thought that they were very strange, strange in worshipping a unique invisible God, so strange that they were called atheists 
misanthropists because they refuse to participate in the social activities. The priests and priestesses were held in high regard. Every good citizen made a point of honour in taking part in those sacrifices and in eating and drinking to excess that went with those pagan sacrifices. These things had been offered to the Roman gods. But there was somebody else, the Nicolaitans. They were similar. Two of the early church fathers link them to Nicholas of Antioch, one of the seven deacons that we find mentioned in Acts chapter 6. He was a proselyte. In other words, he was a Gentile who had converted to Judaism. He came from a pagan background. But then from Judaism, he had converted to Christianity. So he had two conversion experiences, paganism to Judaism and Judaism to Christianity. And so according to these church fathers, he taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that a total separation between Christianity and paganism wasn't essential. He'd changed twice already, and he was suggesting that they could live one life at the same time as practising another one. And according to early church records, it seems that he and his disciples had absolutely no problem in mixing their belief systems, the pagan system and Judaism and Christianity. It was all mixed together in one glorious compromise system. Anything was acceptable. And so it seems that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which was tolerated in Pergamon, was that it was okay to have one foot in one camp and one foot in the other. We didn't need to be separate from the world and be a Christian at the same time. The church at Ephesus had expelled these people but in Pergamon they were tolerated. And of course, as far as some of the Christians were concerned, that made life a lot easier. They could participate actively in the life of the town. They could uh, buy and sell in the local market. They could avoid the criticism of their colleagues and their neighbours. They would avoid disapproval from the authorities who wanted each citizen to show his or her loyalty to Rome. But in so doing, they were ceasing to be a true church, a light in the darkness. And so the Lord issues a warning to them. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you, will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus challenges this church to repent, otherwise he warns of judgment. The church doesn't need to fear the gladius of the proconsul, the one that had killed a faithful Antipas. No, what it needs to fear is the sword that comes out of the Lord's mouth. And in chapter 19, we discover him again mounted on a white horse, judging the nations with that same sword of truth. The problem with this church in Pergamum was that they feared the wrong judge. Instead of being afraid of Rome and thus seeking to minimise the accusation or reproach by the local authorities, they should have been fearing the Lord himself, the judgment from their God. The Lord gives them a promise. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Just as in the other messages, Jesus gives a promise to the one who is victorious, to the one who rejects these false doctrines, who refuses to compromise with the world and resists the temptation to toe the line and join the guilds. And to that person, the Lord Jesus promises three things. First of all, hidden manna. 
The faithful who refused to eat the meat offered to idols were perhaps foregoing their only opportunity to eat meat. But Jesus promises to sustain them with hidden manna, that heavenly food that he gave to the Israelites when they were travelling through the wilderness. It is hidden because the world cannot see it. I'm reminded of Daniel and his colleagues in Babylon who refused to eat the meat that the uh, king uh, ate. He told uh, the person in charge of the diet uh, to put them to the test and let them eat just vegetables and drink only water for a period of 10 days and see what they were like at the end of that time. And having done so, uh, we discover that they were better in appearance and fatter than their companions who hadn't followed the same diet. Jesus knows how to feed those who are faithful to him. In John chapter 6, he promises to nourish his people with living bread from heaven. The second thing that he promised was a white stone. Now there have been, again been many suggestions concerning this stone. Some have suggested that it was a token given to uh, attend the king's festival. Others have thought that it refers back to the Urim and Thummim, the stones of the breastplate of the Jewish high priest. Others see it as being a symbol of victory. But if we take the context into account, it seems likely that there is yet another interpretation. In the ancient courts of law or tribunals, giving a black stone indicated a guilty verdict and therefore condemning someone to death, whereas a white stone indicated acquittal. When the Apostle Paul appeared before King Agrippa, he told him that the authority which had been invested in him by the chief priests and religious authorities and how he had put many, uh, many Christians in prison. And he explained to Agrippa that when death sentences were pronounced, he cast his vote against them. And literally in Acts chapter 26 verse 10, he placed his stone against them. In other words, here in Pergamon, the Roman authorities might condemn them with a black stone, but Jesus would cast his vote, a white stone, in their favour. And then the third promise is a new name, engraved or written on that stone. A new name that only the person who receives it knows. Now, a name signifies your identity, who you are. If you go back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 62, we read this, the nations will see your vindication, all the kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. And in chapter 65 of Isaiah, in the prelude to the announcement of a new heaven and new earth, we read to his servants, he will give another name. In both of those passages, Isaiah is speaking of Israel's restoration to the Lord. But here in Revelation, they're applied to the Lord's faithful, the faithful in the church, the true Israel of God. To the victorious in Pergamon, the Lord promised to give a new name. To the faithful in Philadelphia, he promised three names, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. They have been given the name of a believer in God, in Jesus, in the new Jerusalem. They become new creatures in Christ with a new name and a new address. It's significant that in chapter 19, the rider on the white horse, who is called Faithful and True, also has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. The white stone 
thus binds its recipient to the Saviour, who one day will execute judgment on all who persecute his people. These Christians in Pergamum were no longer inhabitants of that city where Satan had his throne. Their city was in heaven, a new city. They were inhabitants of that city and not of any earthly one. Their citizenship was in heaven. And so we come to a general exhortation.